Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the penultimate lockdown, no, not lockdown live stream, Elephant Professional Lecture of 2021. Um, as with last week, we are in Nepal. Um, last week, we were talking about vultures and, and general community conservation. Uh, this week, we will stick with conservation, but we'll go back to elephants and uh, talk to Jack Edwards or hear from Jack Edwards, who is the managing director of Tiger Tops, which is uh, actually my first stop in Asia was in Tiger Tops in, two, in 1999, uh, where I stayed until 2003. So obviously I, I met Jack back then. Um, and Jack is going to, Tiger Tops have been in Chitwan in Nepal for 57 years uh, in one form or another. Um, obviously Jack hasn't been there that whole time, but he's been, he's been steering the ship for the past few years. And he's gonna tell us a little bit about how Tiger Tops got started, how they were working with elephants in real thick jungle, um, the history of, of what went on and how elephants have, have, have helped them and how they have helped elephants and then go on to the status as it is today with um, Tiger Tops in uh, the area just outside the park, um, which is now, I believe, open and ready to receive guests. So uh, without any further ado, I'll hand you across to Jack and he will tell you about everything that's going on. Thank you so much, John, for having me. And I'm sorry it's taken so long. <laughs> To do this, but um, and yeah, at least I'm not the last. The penultimate is fine. Yeah, as, so as you've mentioned, I think what I will do is talk a little bit about the history of our business. Um, you know, we've been operating in this part of the world for a long time, um, as you said, in, in one form or another. Um, and then I'll go into a little bit about the ethos that we really abide by today and that has been developed over all those years, because that really reflects in terms of what we are trying to achieve with, with our elephants um, in the current day. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about how elephants were used in the past and, and, and the catalyst for our change. And then finally, in terms of, um, you know, fr from the tourism hospitality side, um, you know, how we utilize our elephants um, in, in the current context. Um, so, I think for those that don't know the history of our, our company, um, it was established in 1964 by two Texan hunters, big game hunters who came to Asia to shoot um, primarily big cats, but other wild game. Um, and then they set up a small uh, lodge in a place called Chitwan, which uh, directly translates um, in Taru language as the heart of the jungle. So really deep in the um, lowlands of, of Nepal. Um, they operated the company for a number of years um, without great success um, and sold the business to my father and his business partner who had arrived in Nepal um, at a similar sort of time in the early 60s and were out um, um, hunting, fishing, um, trekking the Himalayas. And a chance meeting with the Texans, I think in New York at the Explorers Club, um, uh, resulted in my father and his business partner, Chuck, Dr. Charles McDougall, um, in acquiring the property in 1970, I think, 70 or 71. They went about instilling changes within the lodge to really focus heavily on, on the wildlife viewing aspect. So swapping out um, guns for cameras. Um, and they lobbied hard with the government. Fortunately, my father was um, quite close to the royal family of Nepal at the time. And they managed to, uh, along with some significant other individuals in the wildlife conservation um, um, fraternity here in Nepal, they managed to convince the government to gazette the, uh, the area that was known as Chitwan into a national park in 1973, I think it was officially um, opened as a national park, which has since now gone on to um, UNESCO World Heritage Status. Um, and then over the years, they developed um, what we believe was one of the pioneering um, responsible tourism concepts, um, certainly within this part of the world. So this was um, the old jungle lodge. And as you can see, um, there are elephants uh, and a lot of them. And in one way or another, elephants were really ingrained with the history of our company. Currently, oops, let me see. Is that better? Yeah, currently we, we, we operate two lodges. This is um, our Kanali Lodge, which was established on the edge of the 
Bardia National Park in far western Nepal. Again, the, the king and the government of Nepal requested um, my father to build this lodge in order to promote tourism in one of the poorest and still one of the poorest regions of the country. Um, the king was going to uh, turn another hunting reserve um, in, in terms of Bardia Wildlife Reserve into a national park, but needed the funding and so requested uh, Tiger Tops to build a lodge and fund the, the, the operations of the national park with the tourism dollars that we bring. And, and lastly, this is our Taru Lodge, for which most of this conversation um, is situated, where our, our elephant camp is, um, and, and where really we have shifted our focus um, with regards to the way that we utilize our elephants. So that all takes place in, in the Taru Lodge. Um, so I think I'll quickly just cover the ethos, the, the ethos behind what we call responsible tourism. And, and for me, really, that um, it, it consists of three pillars. The first pillar being, um, yeah, it, it being the kind of your environmental impact, environmental sustainability. So um, we, what that means from our perspective, that means um, um, utilizing the traditional Taro vernacular styles when it comes to building our lodges, all the um, uh, masonry, all the woodwork, all the thatching is all locally sourced and built um, by, as you can see here in this slide, built by local handy, uh, by local craftsmen. Um, it also means using um, solar power, renewable energies. We have our own organic farms here. Um, this is in Taru, but both lodges have our organic farms, obviously minimizing waste, all the stuff that you, John, obviously are, are, are an expert at. We try our hardest to, to, to follow suit. Um, the second pillar for us is um, community enhancement. Um, that goes from our hiring policy. So I'd say over 90% of our staff are if down at the lodges are hired from the immediate villages that, that surround our lodge, lodges, I should say. Um, and then also from a charitable side, we have um, a charitable school on our um, Taru Lodge um, land, which focuses on providing a free head start to very underprivileged and poor children who would not necessarily even consider going to school or their parents wouldn't consider sending them to school. So we provide them a really safe learning experience before we then send them off and support them in the government run schools. Um, a really successful initiative started in 1996 and continues to run to this day. Um, obviously, we get our guests involved um, and there's some really fun events that happen throughout the year. Um, and then the final pillar and, you know, what kind of excites us or me the most um, is obviously wildlife conservation. Um, and this is really the brainchild of Dr. Charles McDougall, um, my father's business partner, who was an anthropologist um, by, by, I would say, profession. He was a, um, no, not profession, sorry. Um, he, he studied anthropology and he wanted to do a PhD in anthropology in, I think it was in Orissa in India, but then fell in love with tigers and, and teamed up with my father to become the director of wildlife at Tiger Tops. Um, and he really created a number of initiatives um, to focus on the preservation of the jungles and the species that we interact with on a daily basis, even up until today. One of those, um, which is depicted here on this slide, is um, the Long Term Tiger Monitoring Project, which was started in 1974, I believe, and it still runs today, and we still support um, through operational and funding um, means um, the, the, the monitoring of uh, the tiger population within Chetwan National Park. I mean, there are, there are a whole host of other um, initiatives, including DBs. I, I believe he um, um, had a chat with you guys last week, um, including his um, initiative in, in Nawa Parasi, the, the vulture restaurant. Um, we assisted um, him, albeit you know, the vast majority of the work done and the, the brainchild was definitely DB, so I want to give him as much credit as possible, but it was one of the, um, one of the, the projects that we also assisted in um, that is still running today. This is a tiger. I like this photo because it, you can see the camera trap in between its legs here. Um, so that kind of, you know, th those, those are the three pillars which you know, we really focus 
on providing or, or, or adhering to today, I should say. Um, and in conjunction with that, and what is so important with regards to the way we look at our, our elephants is obviously economic sustainability. So that's something that I will come on to um, a little bit later. Um, but you know, we want to do all these amazing things, but if we can't sustain ourselves um, through our tourism dollars, then there's no way we can actually um, enact a lot of these initiatives. This slide um, is obviously a pretty shocking slide, but um, it provides the history around elephants and the use of elephants in Nepal. Um, this actually was taken in 1911. This was a hunt um, put on by the ruling Rana family for King George V, I believe. I think that's him just um, on the right hand side, on the, the far right tiger, if you can see him on there with a the moustache. Um, this, that was, this hunt was put on for King George V in 1911. And the reason why I've depicted it is you can see a row of heads of elephants at the back. So elephants were instrumental in corralling game for um, big game hunters to shoot. In this, particular, um, in this particular hunt, I think they took 39 tigers, 18 rhinos and four sloth bears. And you can see one sloth bear in the front here. And the reason why I'm talking about this is big game hunting was banned, officially banned in Nepal in 1961. There, was, there were hunts on a smaller scale after that. But what happened was, was a number of these elephants basically went out, out of jobs, um, as well as the, the trackers and, and, and the professional hunters, the Nepalese hunters. They were out of jobs. So Tiger Tops um, took on a large number of these people. And that really formed the basis of um, you know, our experience of, of, of the jungle. Um, so our very first elephants, um, this is the very first photo of tiger tops, which still exists, um, of the staff in front of the stilted lodge. Um, and the, yeah, the elephants were all previously used on, on big game hunts. Um, and then as my father and Chuck took over the business, Obviously, they stopped the hunting and, and um, carried on with wildlife safaris, but very much on elephant back, very much still using the original um, tiger trackers and what we call shikars, um, um, you know, throughout that period. This is the first photo of my father with an elephant. So I think this was in, in the mid-60s. in the mid um, And, you know, we as a family have been um, really entwined with the species, you know, ever since he first went to Nepal. And I've been um, obviously surrounded by elephants um, really since my birth. In fact, I was actually given an elephant on my third birthday, which was kind of amazing. <laughs> so I did have a very peculiar upbringing, but um, in one that I, you know, truly cherish and the ability to spend so much time around elephants, you know, is, is, is truly amazing. Um, so over the course of the years, the way our elephants were used changed, obviously, but um, it was always practical in nature. So this photo here is at the Magali airstrip. Our guests would land, uh, disembark the aircraft and immediately um, climb on the back of an elephant because the roads to the, the heart, to the jungle lodge and to the heart of the jungle were really difficult and treacherous. So the best method of transport was elephants. So this was not a marketing gimmick. This was not, you know, to, to um, you know, provide a, a, a false kind of illusion to our guests. We really had to get our guests from A to B and hence why the elephants would go to the airstrip and pick up both our guests and also to transport supplies. Um, we utilize our elephants and still do occasionally for um, anti-poaching patrols. So here you see some army um, personnel sitting on the back of an elephant doing um, rounds in, inside the national park. We support the national park department and their rangers in terms of um, uh, doing rhino census, um, just, just general conservation work. So our elephants, um, previously were heavily involved and now less so given the changes that I will be discussing a bit later, but we're still very much involved in, in um, anti-poaching and, and wildlife conservation within, within the Chitwan area. Um, but obviously the, the main 
the main use for our elephants was as a vehicle to show our uh, guests, um, you know, the plethora of wildlife that's on offer within um, the Chitwan and the, the Turai area. And this is the, the quintessential old photo, which John, I'm sure you've seen millions of times, um, but of our elephants going out on safari in front of um, some of the stilted rooms here. Um, and this is what a typical safari scene would look like in, in Nepal. And I think, you know, this is, again, I'll talk a bit of, a little bit more about it later, but I think this is the very big difference between what we are faced with here in Nepal than let's say you are in Thailand and in Myanmar and Laos is, is really the other big game that, um, you know, the, the density of big, big game that is found within the jungles and, and obviously all the, obviously all the worries that 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 they bring um and and that dictates the way that we really work with our elephants but this is a classic um safari scene in in the old days um so what 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 are we looking for well there are hundreds of species and in, including nine percent of the world's bird population to be found in nepal but People come really in Nepal, really come to Nepal to see basically five animals, what we call the big five. The number one being the Bengal tiger, um, obviously the leopard, uh, the great uh, one horned rhino. Um, Chitwan is, I think, the second, has the second largest um, population of greater one horned rhino in anywhere in Asia, the largest being Kazaringa National Park. Um, then the sloth bear. Uh, and finally, the Indian bison, which I think you do find in Thailand, if, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so our guests over the last 50 years were really treated to some spectacular wildlife viewing. Um, and that was pri primarily done on elephant bank, uh, back along with um, obviously jeep safaris and, and, and boat safaris, but, but elephants were really the mainstay of the experiences that were on offer within the um, Tiger Tops Jungle Lodge. Um, so in 2012, unfortunately, the government of Nepal forced us to close down our original um, Jungle Lodge um, due to a change of policy, which meant that our elephants lost their home. Um, and this was really the catalyst um, of the changes that we've enacted um, in the recent past. Our elephants spent their whole lives deep inside the jungle, near no settlements, were able to graze in their off time in, in their natural environment. Due to the shuttering of our lodge in 2012, we moved our elephants to our 20 well, it's a 30 acre site, but 20 of those acres are dedicated to our elephants. And that is at our Tari Lodge, um, which borders the Chitwan National Park. So we're still kind of semi in the jungle, um, or I'd say in the very close to the buffer zones, which DB was talking about um, last week, um, but, but very much um, a, a elephant camp setting as opposed to a jungle setting. And that got us thinking, you know, our elephants were at that time chained still um, and they spent four to five hours a day chained to their posts without really being able to go into the jungles um, to, to the same degree that they were previously. Um, and this coincided with, I, th I think, a, a, a shift in, in perception globally about what, you know, how animals are treated and, you know, obviously the welfare. Of, of certainly exotic animals such as elephants. Um, so what did we want to do? Well, obviously the first thing was improve the husbandry standards. Um, we got to Taru, realized we had this really nice big plot of land, realized our elephants were being chained for, 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 for such a long period of time during the day. So we built these um, enormous corrals over 20, as I said, 20 acres. Um, to give our elephants more autonomy, the ability to interact with each other, and just a bit more, more freedom on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we've also improved um, other, area, or other areas of our facilities, uh, shelters. Um, we've built a few of these, um, uh, sorry, watering fountains. Unfortunately, due to COVID, we weren't able to 
complete the project due to lack of funding and being shut for 18 months. Um, but that's something that we will hopefully complete um, in the coming months. Um, so from a husbandry perspective, uh, we enacted some really serious change. And this really was the first of its kind, I believe, in Nepal. Um, and so it was very difficult working with our mahouts who for generations have been looking after elephants in a particular way and then to come in and say no we've been doing this wrong or well, not wrong we've, we've always believed that we treated our elephants well but how can how can we improve it and this is a conversation that happened over actually months with our with our elephant staff until they finally um, were on board and and uh, these corrals were built um, yeah, it was just it was just immensely difficult to change after after 50 years, but I think the results were amazing and today this is um, not a recent photo, but this is certainly a photo after the corrals had been utilized for quite a long period, as you can see elephants. Um, with a lot more freedom um, interacting with their loyal mahouts and and obviously each other today we only have about one one to three elephants per corral. Uh, we had to learn, unfortunately, the hard way with regards to elephants fighting and stealing each other's food and really working out which elephants were suitable with which. Obviously, elephants are very complex beings with very social hierarchy and you know, complex social structures. So it was, a, it was a really interesting but difficult time uh, to, to work out which elephants were, were compatible with, with which other elephants. Unfortunately, this elephant here on the left, Sita Kali, who John, I I think you might remember, she died of uh, tuberculosis, I think it was four, three years ago, three years ago, which is not on the scope of this, um, this chat, but I think probably, in our opinion, one of the biggest threats to captive elephant populations, and unfortunately, Sita Kali succumbed to TB. So these three other elephants, Gulab Kali in the middle, and the two young elephants, Saraswati and Sandra Kali, um, are still together and enjoying life in their corrals. Um, this is just another perspective um, of the corrals, obviously happy elephants. Um, and I think we're really lucky uh, because we have such good substrate. The, the, the soil is very sandy and porous here. So we don't really get boggy um, uh, you know, boggy land in the in the rainy season. Obviously, in some areas we do, but we're, we're really fortunate in terms of the substrate is really good for our elephants. So we rarely have, you know, any serious foot problems. Um, what's next? And this is just a close up of the wiring. I'm not sure you can see that. So yeah, I mean, life at, at the camp is very different to what it was. Um, you know, seven, seven or eight years ago, but we believe we are, you know, it's a step in the right direction. Um, but we are so far away from where we want to be. Um, actually, let, yeah, let me just talk about the, the, the elephant staff. So I think we obviously as owners of the company, myself and Christian, who is really instrumental in, in enacting this change all those years ago, I'd say those seven years ago, and I've now kind of taken on the, the task of, of furthering his vision. Um, but we couldn't have done this without, you know, our, our staff. And that goes from the head of our elephant camp, or what we call the Suba. This chap is called Kale Kumal, and he's worked with Tiger Tops for 36 years now. Um, and his second in charge, Krishna, who we call the Rawat, has now worked for Tiger Tops for 45 years. So we're talking about um, 80 years of experience between just two individuals, um, all of their time spent with the elephants at Tiger Tops. Behind them, they have a team of another 24 individuals looking after 12 elephants. Um, so we now have two, uh, two individuals, two mahouts per elephant. It used to be three when the workload was, was much tougher in, in the you know, uh, environment of, of the deep jungle, but within the Taru um, elephant camp complex, um, two per elephant is sufficient. And many, many of these mahouts have at least 10 to 15 years experience often with uh, on the same elephant. This is Bikaram, he's been with us for 25 years. Um, 
this photo I just I don't know whether to be depressed or 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 laugh about but coronavirus you know has affected all of us and this is the current situation of working with elephants um you know even down down in the pretty remote area of Nepal uh, wearing face masks while going about their their daily duties um so we enacted that change the with the focus on improving the husbandry standards of of our elephants but we feel that we're so far away from truly understanding what exactly we should be doing so one of the big changes that we've made is to really invite as many people as possible from all over the world to help teach us um or, you know we can learn from their experiences and most importantly from a scientific perspective help us understand our elephants um, much more closely and, and, and which can then in the future help us provide for our elephants um, in a better way. So this, currently we have um, Dr. Hannah Mumby, who I'm sure a number of you are familiar with. Um, she's, in our opinion, one of the top elephant scientists in the world. I think she was a graduate of Cambridge University, Fulbright Scholar, and now currently a professor at Hong Kong University. And her team have been coming for the last two to three years um, and doing certain research on our elephants. I can't talk too much about it because uh, their papers are still being published and she really would crucify me if I started talking too deeply about the work that they're doing. But it focuses primarily on behavior and and the physiological effect of stress um, or certain stresses on, on, on our elephants. So um, she's, they're currently um, doing that at the moment. And one of her students, Sagarika, um, is, is down there uh, currently and working with our herd. This is one of her setups, but again, I can't really unfortunately talk too much about what they're up to. In the past, I think this was 2018, um, we had Dr. Angela Stoger and her team down um, at the camp uh, and they were focused on elephant communication and language. Um, Veronica, who you can see here on the left, um, she was focusing, I um, believe on um, the way elephants actually produce um, high pitched sounds um, the squeaks and how they have adapted that, I suppose, in a, in a human setting. I don't think it's a natural, um, um, I don't think it's a natural way that elephants communicate, but um, certainly the elephant which is behind Dependra Kali, who's here at the front, Pawan Kali, she squeaks all morning um, to convince her mahout to give her more fodder. So I think this is really a learned behavior or a behavior that's been modified um, to, to um, communicate with their human counterparts. Um, this is down at the river. At the river, obviously, the elephants are very sociable. They love, the, you know, they're big water babies. Um, and, and so a lot of the interactions between elephants and the communication um, between elephants uh, or the visible uh, communication between elephants happens down, down by the river. So lots of their experiments were set up there. Um, and then this is, um, yeah, just another sort of slide depicting that. So we've also invited, um, from a husbandry perspective, we've also invited a number of elephant professionals um, from all over the world come. We've held foot trimming workshops. Uh, like I said before, our elephants, I mean, they do occasionally get have problems, but not to the degree that I've seen in, in other um, establishments in other countries. Um, and I think we're just really lucky with the substrate that, that, that our elephants um, um, live on in camp. As you can see, it's really kind of sandy, sandy um, soil. Um, but we host foot trimming workshops. Um, I really enjoyed having um, Tony Nevin come, come and look at one of our elephants who had a bad uh, leg. He's um, an, an animal osteopath. We've had um, uh, people come from, from a behavioral perspective, from an enrichment perspective. Um, we've had a number of scientists, I think, including Janine, who's done a done one of your lectures. Um, but yeah, I think we really want to open open our elephants up to to you know the wider elephant community, so we collectively can understand elephants um, um, in a captive setting, uh, uh, you know, much better. Because I feel we're really at the start of this whole process. 
Um, so that brings me on to, you know, uh, the hospitality side of things. Obviously, part of our ethos is economic um, sustainability. And I personally don't believe that, you know, all captive elephants in Asia, I don't know how many there are now, I presume four or five thousand, um, can be sustained by charitable donations alone. So there has to be a way in which we can provide you know, for these elephants. Um, and in, in our opinion, it's, it's through tourism dollars. Now at Tiger Tops, we really, we're really not in the art of gimmicks. So we, we're not gonna create a riding camp for the sake of creating a riding camp. Um, before ending our safaris, the elephants were utilized as a vehicle to see wild game and it worked very effectively. We truly believe that since we stopped the safaris, and I will show you a, a, this photo here, um, this is a classic um, situation that our elephants would often encounter on safari. On the right is a charging rhino, and on the a, a left is clearly a very stressed elephant, ears flared and trunk hitting the, the ground to try and shoo off the rhino. Above, you can see the Mahout holding a stick. Now we, part of the reasoning, part of the discussions that were held about how do we, you know, improve the welfare standards of our elephants. A lot of it revolved around hitting elephants with the sticks and utilizing of the bull hooks. Um, we realized that 95 or even higher percent of all use of, uh, of these instruments was on safari. Um, when the elephants required a greater level of control, um, when they had, you know, stressed, <laughs> stressed wild game in, in their immediate vicinity. Elephants and rhinos in the wild typically do not interact at such a close um, uh, distance. They will try and avoid each other. The same goes for tigers, leopards, all the big uh, game animals that I showed to you previously. Whereas when we were on safari, we were actively looking for these interactions. So that required an extra you know, heightened level of control, which inevitably um, resulted in the use of sticks and uncuses. So if we're gonna take this seriously, we realize that if we wanna improve the welfare standards of our herd, we cannot realistically justify utilizing our elephants to go on um, elephant safaris. So we had to stop the safaris. And since then, the use of our uh, sticks and bull hooks are, are almost non-existent. Our mahouts still ride our elephants and they still carry sticks. So we, this, this is kind of a subtle um, point that I would like to make. A lot of people, you know, they, they hear about us either in the press or through word of mouth and they come and visit us and they're shocked to see our elephants being ridden by their mahouts on a daily basis. We believe, we strongly believe that there's actually nothing wrong with what riding an elephant as long as you can do it safely, as long as you limit the load, as long as the elephant is being fed properly, um, if it has the appropriate medical attention, then riding an elephant is not harmful. We did it for over 55 years on, say, on the same individual, in fact, uh, Lakshmi Kali came to us from the government. She was used. Um, she was used as as um, as a hunting elephant. She then took people on safaris. She then um, obviously was part of the change. And unfortunately, she died last year at the ripe old age of I think it was about seventy two to seventy four, which really is amazing. And you know, it's an anecdote. Obviously, it's anecdotal, but. Um, she was carrying people on her back for 30 years and there was no real um, long-term um, physiological issues that she had with, you know, with, with her body um, after all those years of carrying elephants. So we really believe that the, this, this debate conversation as to whether you can and cannot ride elephants, is, it's much more complicated and it's not as simple as you must not ride an elephant. Um, so, yeah, so I think, you know, we, we decided to stop, stop safaris. Well, what do we do instead? So, you know, along, we, we thought long and hard about, about the experiences that we wanted to provide our guests. You know, we, 
are still in the tourism business. Our elephants um, are still elephants that have to work. You know, we're not a sanctuary. We're not just letting elephants loose in a compound and feeding them bananas and allowing people to take uh, photographs. We're not in that game. Um, so we really needed to come up with genuine um, experiences, um, which were, you know, um, which were which were incredible for our guests to experience, but um, also had very much the elephant welfare in mind. Um, and so we decided, well, what does our, what do our elephants do? What are the daily routines? Um, and we just closely followed that. So um, our typical guest will go and visit the elephant camp um, with their designated um, naturalist. He will explain to them how the elephant camp runs. He will introduce them to our mahouts and our herd, explain to them the changes that we've enacted. They can get their hands dirty and, and help clear corrals. They can um, you know, make what this lady here on the left is making, and which are our elephant sandwiches, um, and just really immerse themselves in elephant camp life. Obviously, <laughs> the mahouts are far better at creating these sandwiches um, of which a hundred sandwiches per elephant per day is required. So they get very proficient at, at making them. Um, but yeah, just really immersing themselves in, in, in the daily life of... John, you still there? Sorry, I just feel like we had a power cut. Yep, we're still here and we're still, still, still <laughs> hearing you, Jack, carry on. All right, that's good. I, I, our lights just switched, so uh -oh. that means that the power's <laughs> gone and we're, we're on the backup generator, so I'm glad that's all working well. Your Wi-Fi still um, Good, good. Yeah, so um, this is another you know, picture of our daily elephant life. Um, and then the second, you know, so once they've gone to see elephant camp, you know, we encourage them to go down and, and assist our mahouts with the fodder collection to really show them actually how hard um, a mahout's life is. You know, they typically have to collect up to 100 and 150 kilos, depending on, on, on the species of the plant, but 150 kilos of fodder a day. So we, we send our guests down early mornings with, um, with our mahouts. Um, they show them how to tie bundles of grass, um, how elephants then stack them on their backs um, and then transport them back to camp. Obviously, it's not all hard work and we set up picnic breakfasts with them. Our naturalists go with them and they do jungle walks, bird watching um, and have a really lovely uh, picnic in the middle of the jungle. And, and strangely, as someone you know, who's grown up and uh, around elephants my entire life. I thought this would be one of the most boring and tedious um, experiences that we offer, but it, our guests really rave about it um, because I think it really gives you uh, such a deep insight to, to, to what our mahouts have to go through on a, on a daily basis. Um, we then, the elephants then go out to graze, um, unfortunately not as often as they used to, but we still have the ability to take our elephants to graze um, in land that we have either leased or, or within the buffer zones of the national parks. Unfortunately, they can't actually enter the, the, the national park, the core areas of the national parks anymore, but they are still able to graze. And again, we are happy to you know, provide a bit of hospitality around that experience. So, so our guests um, are comfortable during the duration. But I cannot really under you know, emphasize the, the importance of grazing. Um, and I asked um, my naturalist to compile a list of, of all the plants that our elephants eat um, during their grazing session. And on the left-hand side here, and I presume you can't really read what they all are, but on the left-hand side here, I think there are 32 different species of plants which have been record our elephants have been recorded eating whilst they were out in the jungle grazing. And you cannot replicate this through fodder collection. You really cannot do that. Um, it's too much time, it's too much effort, um, and, and elephants are very, very particular. On the right-hand side here um, is a list of all the medicinal plants, either the elephants eat themselves or we feed our elephants or use externally um, on our elephants um, that we collect from the jungle. And this is you know, knowledge that has been passed down from our mahout, from mahout to mahout, um, over the last 50 years and before that, um, you know, um, many generations. 
Um, so yeah, we really believe we try our absolute hardest to get our elephants out grazing um, as much as possible. And, you know, we often get calls or emails from uh, other elephant sanctuaries around Asia asking us if we have gastrointestinal problems with our elephants with bloating and so on. And we, I don't think since I've been back in the company in the last five, six years, I have not seen a single one of our elephants suffer from, from any of those sorts of issues. And I put that down to the fact that they have such an amazing varied diet, focus um, very much on roughage rich um, um, fodder, uh, sorry, um, plants, i.e. bark, branches, um, thick leaves, as opposed to feeding our elephants with fruits. In fact, our fr um, fruit is a, almost banned, almost banned from, from our elephant camp, um, which I believe is, is not the case in, in, in many other places where tourists are encouraged to feed bananas and watermelons and um, pineapples and so on to, to, to their elephants. And I really do truly believe the reason why our, our elephants don't have those problems is that they don't eat fruit and they eat a lot of um, branches. Um, so then, yeah, I suppose the, the, the activity which, which everyone really, you know, really the most marketable activity, but the activity which most of our guests focus on, which are our, uh, the walks that we, we provide. So we don't do elephant safaris anymore, um, but our elephants still walk a lot during the day. And, and in the wild, I believe elephants can walk almost 40 kilometers a day um, going to, you know, during their migration. So we encourage our elephants to be out and active as much as possible and we ask our, uh, our guests to tag along. So the focus here is very much to be in the elephant's environment, you know, see how the elephant interacts with its environment. Um, and if we're lucky, we have the ability to see other wild game, but that's certainly not really the focus. Um, our team of experienced naturalists will, you know, talk about the, the, jung the jungle in the wider context. You know, I think here on this photo, he's showing a fresh tiger pug mark. So during your walks, you are able to really understand, you know, the, in more depth, the flora and fauna um, um, of, yeah, the jungles that surround, surround our elephant camp. Um, and then we hope that we come across some big game and, and really it's not too uncommon. Uh, I'd say at least one group on a day, daily basis will encounter rhinos. But the big difference between um, this encounter and, and the safari is that this is very much on the rhino's term. Um, the elephants are much more relaxed. The guests are at a safe distance um, and the rhinos usually barely even notice the presence um, um, of the elephants or the guests, partly because rhinos have terrible, <laughs> terrible senses, but, uh, but also I think because they, they have this ability to determine whether they are being actively corralled, pressurized, or whether people are just um, viewing at a safe distance. Occasionally we do get a little bit closer um, and rhinos, you know, do take notice in, position the elephants um, in front of the guests um, in order to, to provide a safe viewing environment. Um, and this is really, I'd say, <laughs> a photo that encapsulates that experience. I mean, it's truly amazing. And I just don't think that there's anywhere in the world that we that can provide a, an experience like this one. Um, so yeah, we're really lucky. We're really, really lucky. Um, and then the, what I call the pièce de résistance is in the afternoons and evenings of, of the hot months, um, our elephants are taken to the river where they can cool off, they can socialize, they can get off their feet. Um, we absolutely do not allow any of our guests to enter the water or wash the elephants or ride the elephants um, because it really is the one time where the elephants are as relaxed as they can possibly be. Um, the river there is huge. It's the Naraini River. It's one of the tributaries of the Ganges and one of the, I suppose, most holy rivers in, in the Himalayas. 
um, but it's a very big, deep uh, river and the elephants can swim, they can socialize, they can play, um, and it becomes quite a dangerous environment, especially for young children um, like this. Um, but in, in any case, you know, you see the really the natural um, characteristics of each elephant um, in this environment because they're, they're so happy. Um, and so it, the experience is truly amazing. But it's not all, you know, doom and gloom. We set up a bar on the on the banks of the river and the, our guests can enjoy a cold gin and tonic or a beer while the elephants are, are playing just mere meters away. Um, and obviously for photo ops, um, it's, it's a great, it's a great <laughs> opportunity as well. And I think this is really the last slide that I want to show you. And the reason why I've put this on here is because I, I really want to emphasize that, you know, what we're trying to achieve here with our elephants is just a continuation of, of the ethos of our company. And this photo, um, you know, this photo encapsulates what, what I believe our company stands for. We've on the left here, we've got our, some of our guests enjoying, um, enjoying a sundowner. Um, we have a traditional dugout canoe uh, manned by um, a, one of our staff members who's lived and grown up on this exact river his entire life. Um, he's just coming back from taking guests on a canoe ride, our vintage Land Rovers um, waiting to take the guests back, back to their accommodation. And then on the far right are elephants going about their daily business um, while the sun is setting. And this, really, this is not a staged photo. I just happened to be um, visiting the guests who were down there and it, it all kind of came together. And so I took this um, photo um, uh, yeah, and it I, in my opinion, it really encapsulates, um, you know, what, what, what we are trying to achieve from, from, a, from a guest experience perspective. Um, and and, and that's, that's it, really. Um, so I think the last thing I'll say, John, before you take over is, you know, we've been in the wildlife tourism conservation game for 57 years. Um, and during that period of time, Jim and Chuck, they took, you know, responsible tourism and but particularly wildlife conservation very, very seriously. Um, in the recent past, we've not entirely pivoted. We still, we still do all of that, but we have pivoted into taking elephant welfare extremely seriously. Um, and we are just at the start of that process. So I feel like we're doing a good job, but I feel like we're you know there's so much more to learn and there's so much more to do um but we yeah i, I we have a clear vision of, of what we want which is to improve you know the welfare standards of captive elephants in nepal and, and, and the wider continent jack thank you very much uh particularly for the panel all right did i did i ramble on a bit too much no i think you you must have answered all the questions because there are no questions at all on facebook so you i think you you covered all the bases um and and a, a nice audience out there but if anyone does have any questions please do type them into the facebook chat i've finally managed to to open it now um and we can see that uh, and i can I can vouch that the, uh, the penultimate slide wasn't staged. Um, I'm having it bringing back many, many, many memories, and I'm sort of wondering how I can next get out there and see it because it's a fantastic, fantastic memories and fantastic time. And and certainly everybody I think should go and visit you. And uh, congratulations on what I consider to be a, a job very well done. Um, I I do know how difficult it is, not exactly to make the transition that 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 you guys have made, but a similar similar ones that we attempt to do here and um, particularly actually banning fruit is there, <laughs> but all of the other things. And, and you do, I also back up what you're saying about grazing as well. In that we don't have, we don't have a big buffer zone to, to play in, but we also over the last couple of years following elephants around on the live stream is being able to see exactly or see, see the variety of plants that they, they choose. Um, it's impossible to provision. Um, so you, you have to have an area of land like that. Um, Lobsang, you're on the Zoom. Do you have any questions? Would you like to unmute yourself and ask, or if anybody else would like to type? If not, we will let uh, Jack go about his day. Perfect. Well, that was easy. <laughs> yeah, well, you covered you covered all the details, I think, which is a, which always always helps. Um, and yes, June says thank you for a beautiful photograph and a great talk. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully we've inspired some people to come out and see you. 
Yeah, sounds good. Okay, well that's it. If there are no all questions right. at all, fantastic. Um, as well, I said, I'm 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 just in nostalgic mode because I, I I do do miss Chit One, and um, even after even after 20 years away and or 19 years away and. and Thailand, North Thailand being very definitely my home. Just the pictures of the, the river and the proper jungle really, uh, really mean I've got itchy feet. So, um, uh, yep. Yeah, well, look forward to hosting you, John. And thank you so much for having me on. Honestly, it was it was great. No, no, very good. Thank you for coming and, and being being a part of it. And uh, yes, we will be in touch. We're, we're chatting off and on anyway. Um, be in touch, and we'll see you very soon. So I think that's it. Um, Thank you very much again, and thank you everybody for joining. A lots of more thank yous coming through on the thing, but no questions. So we will let you go and uh, enjoy, and enjoy your Perfect. afternoon, and uh, we will see you on the other side. Sounds good. All right, thanks.